We're going to look at two chapters of the prophet Isaiah tonight, uh, rather than our usual one chapter. We're looking through the prophet Isaiah chapter by chapter. Tonight we're going to look at chapter 15 and 16. Uh, the reason for the two chapters is that basically, really, technically, it's one chapter. It's one burden. It's one thought. And so the division is not natural. Uh, it was a sort of a man-made division. So chapter 15 and 16 really is one uh, thought from the Lord, one prophecy. It's the burden of Moab. We get in that in chapter 15, verse 1. The burden of Moab, it's an oracle or a message that was given to the prophet Isaiah from God concerning the country of Moab. And we've been seeing that in this section of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah is looking at these different uh, Gentile nations that surrounded Israel or were enemies of Israel or were some way associated with Israel and what their future would be would be, and, and for most of them it would be judgment. For some of them, they would be judged and sort of disappear off the world stage. Some would be judged and reappear again in the latter days uh, and then disappear, uh, be totally wiped out. Uh, there'll be others that will reappear in the last days, be judged, but be restored and blessed by the Lord and will appear in the millennial kingdom of Christ. So, uh, now, this burden has to do with the country of Moab. And Moab, uh, as far as its geographical situation, is just east of, east, and a little bit south of uh, Israel, but mostly in the easterly direction, what we call the Transjordan, on the eastern side of the Jordan River, in the Dead Sea region. Uh, today, that area is occupied by the country called Jordan. Uh, Moab has an inter interesting history in connection with Israel. In fact, it was related to Israel. You know, if you go back to Genesis uh, and Lot, his oldest daughter, um, had an incestuous uh, relationship with him himself. And uh, Moab was a result of that relationship. So the nation of Moab uh, comes from Lot and his eldest daughter. Uh, <clears throat> Moab always had sort of a bit of a, a tense relationship with Israel, but it was never a nation that, uh, was one of the sworn enemies of Israel as such, um, like some of their uh, great enemies. But there was always a bit of a tension there. We see Ruth, uh, the Moabitess, came down and married Boaz. That was a positive development. But she left her gods, and she came to trust in the God of Israel. The God of Moab was Chemosh, which is a horrible deity. And that's one of the reasons why Moab is being judged, also for its pride. And the time when Isaiah wrote this, uh, Moab was a very prosperous country, but a very idolatrous country, a very arrogant and proud country. In the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were coming out of the wilderness and coming into the Canaan, and they were in the plains of Moab. You can read about this in Deuteronomy and Numbers. And they sought to pass through the country of Moab, through the king's highway. But the Moabites, uh, Moabites uh, resisted that. They wouldn't let Israel uh, uh, take the king's highway, so they had sort of skirt around the outskirts of Moab. In the days of King David, I think, if I recall correctly, his parents uh, took refuge uh, in the days of Saul uh, in in the kingdom of of Moab. So as we look at this, um, at these two chapters, for the most part, we have to say that it's it's already been fulfilled. If you look at the end of chapter sixteen, verse fourteen, it says, "But now the Lord hath." spoken saying within three years as the years of a hireling or as the years of a hired man the glory of moab shall be condemned with all that great multitude and the remnant shall be a very small and feeble and so uh, we see isaiah saying that the fulfillment of this was was near at hand it would be for a determined length of time like as a as a man that is hired to do a particular job for a set period of time like a contract, and then it would be fulfilled. So it was certain it would come to pass. It was a set period. It says uh, uh, within three years. Bible scholars aren't quite sure when the beginning of that three years was, and it, it did have reference to uh, <clears throat> three years from the, the giving of this prophecy, <clears throat> which is the, uh, the majority view. But at any rate, it was probably fulfilled when the Assyrians came down with Sennacherib and uh, <clears throat> came into Moab. And if you read through uh, the description of what happens here in this chapter, we can't take the time to go through these two chapters, but uh, it, it, the, the impression is a time period of great distress and great uh, anguish and great suffering, 
uh, for the people of Moab. And what's uh, interesting about this is in verse 5, it says, My heart shall cry out for Moab. His fugitives shall flee unto Zoar, and a heifer of three years old. So uh, here we have the heart of Isaiah. God doesn't rejoice in judgment, even of those who uh, uh, perhaps deserve it. Uh, you know, the Lord hasn't rewarded us according to our iniquities. And even when judgment does come, the Bible says it's his strange work, his slow work. And he's slow uh, to bring judgment. He's full of long suffering. And even when the judgment comes, I think you see the Spirit of God in Isaiah in verse 5. five My heart shall cry out from Moab and for her fugitives. But as I say, at the end of chapter 16, the very last verse, it says that a remnant shall, uh, will be spared to Moab, a very small, feeble remnant. And they would grow again into a, a nation, a country from that judgment. And we see 140 years later, uh, Jeremiah predicts uh, another disaster uh, when the Babylonians uh, would fall upon them. And that's in Jeremiah uh, chapter uh, 48. We can't take too much time on Jeremiah's prophecy here. But he speaks of this as well. And, but he does say in verse 47, Yet will I bring again the captivity of Moab in the latter days, saith the Lord, thus far as the judgment of Moab, that their captivity will be brought again in the latter days. This is interesting because uh, we see in the prophecies, for example, in Daniel chapter 11, when the king of the north comes down, at the end of the Great Tribulation, the king of the north, the Assyrian, when he comes down, he will spare Moab and Edom, those two countries that dwelt in that region. You can read that in Daniel uh, chapter 11, verse 41. It says, He shall uh, enter also into the glorious land, that is the king of the north, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. And so Edom will be spared, but they're spared for a reason. And this brings us to um, chapter 16, verse 4 of our chapter, which by the spirit of prophecy launches out into that future time. Remember what I've been saying to you about this, is that we, the majority of this has been fulfilled in the past with the destruction of Moab, the disaster that fell upon them through the Assyrians, and then later the Babylonians. But they will reappear again. In the last days, perhaps it's the country of Jordan. Uh, <clears throat> but um, the Lord says that they will be spared when the king of the north and, and the future Assyrian comes down, um, uh, backed by Russia. Can't go into all the details there, but uh, this will happen according to prophecy. And then uh, we get this interesting thing in chapter uh, 16, verse 4, um, where it says, Let my outcasts dwell with the Moab, I should read it uh, uh, from the Derby translation here. Uh, Let my outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert or a covert to them, a protection to them, from the face of the waster, from the face of the waster. The waster is the the Assyrian, the king of the north. For the extortioner is at an end. Uh, the wasting has ceased, and the oppressors are consumed of the land. That. God calls upon Edom in the last days to protect his people. And I believe <clears throat> we see a fulfillment of this in Revelation chapter 12. And we get in chapter 12, uh, verse uh, 14. We'll back up to verse 13. And the dragon, that is Satan, saw that he was cast onto the earth, and he persecuted the woman, that's Israel, which brought forth the man-child, or the male child. And the woman... And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into a place where she shall be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years, three and a half years of the great tribulation. And, and the, the serpent will cast out of his mouth a, a water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman. And we believe that this may be the fulfillment of this, is when uh, uh, the Edomites, the future Edomites, perhaps the country of Jordan, perhaps in Petra, that region there, that Israel will be protected. They'll be sheltered from this uh, uh, judgment. At least a remnant of them uh, will be. So that's interesting. So we get the uh, past fulfillment and we get a future projection. We see this again and again and again. 
uh, through Isaiah. Then we get this striking uh, messianic prophecy in verse 5. And this is how we know that verse 4 is yet future because of verse 5. Look, it says, And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hastening, hastening righteousness. This is a messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy about Messiah, the son of David, the one who will come. And it says that in mercy his throne will be established. And he shall sit in truth in the tabernacle of David. David's throne will be established again in the earth. And will be the Lord Jesus Christ who will reign from it. Judging, seeking judgment, and hasting righteousness. His reign of, uh, uh, will be a reign of righteousness, of justice, uh, and um, judgment. Uh, there will be peace in the earth. The knowledge of the Lord the glory of the Lord will fill the earth, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. He will reign in righteousness from the river unto the ends of the earth. So we get this wonderful gem of a prophecy about Messiah right smack dab in the middle of all this disaster that for the most part has been fulfilled yet is yet to come. It, it's fulfilled but not yet. And we get this again and again as I said in the prophets. So I just... Uh, Hope that this will encourage you. Some of the things that we may draw from it is, first of all, the mercy and sympathy of the Lord, even when we don't deserve it, where we see Isaiah saying, my heart cries out for Moab. May we be compassionate people too. When we see others suffering, maybe those who don't know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, maybe those who you would consider your enemies, they fall into bad times or into trouble or into deep sorrow. It's not our place to rejoice over them but rather that our heart would grieve for them and cry out for them and pray for them. This is God's will for us as believers uh, to be like him, to be like our Father which is in heaven, whose reign falls on the just and on the unjust. Well, may the Lord encourage you today as we continue on uh, through our study in the prophet Isaiah. Amen.